Thanks to the organizers for inviting me. Uh, yes, so I'm going to talk about symplectic Kalman approximation on co-adjoint orbits. Um, and the starting point uh, is a question uh, asked by Nassim, uh, that if you take a smooth, C infinity smooth symplectomorphism on R2n, R2n sits inside C2n, uh, then the question is if this is approximable in the sense of Kalman by elements of this holomorphic symplectic uh, group, leaving R2n invariant. All right, uh, and of course, uh, uh, symplectic on R2 just means that, uh, that phi preserves this uh, symplectic form, and then the analog uh, uh, thing for the holomorphic, in the holomorphic case. And then, uh, what does this Kalman approximation mean? Uh, this means that uh, for any continuous function on uh, R2n, strictly positive, uh, there should exist a holomorphic real symplectomorphism uh, of C2n, so that this psi approximates phi uh, to um, precision epsilon of x uh, for x on R2n. So now the point is that this is uh, much more than uniform uh, approximation or even or approximation on compacts, so this epsilon could go to zero uh, as fast as you want, as x goes to infinity. And if you can, you can also, uh, and we will do that later, throw in some derivatives here you want to approximate. So anyhow, I thought uh, I'd just start by, um, before I start discussing this, just uh, go through a little bit of uh, the history of uh, Kalman approximation for functions, uh, in case uh, many of you didn't see that before. So a little uh, history, so this is not uh, Kalman approximation, but something maybe all of you know, uh, that Weierstrass proved that any continuous function on an interval a, b is uniformly approximable by polynomials. Uh, Runge theorem tells you that if k is a compact set uh, with c minus k connected, then any function f holomorphic on k, so this means holomorphic on a neighborhood of k, may be approximated uh, by polynomials. Uh, and then comes uh, this Kalman theorem, which is a generalization of, uh, of Weierstrass, uh, telling that you can replace the, open in the closed interval by the real line. And then there is the corresponding statement that I had before, any continuous function on the entire real line can be approximated to precision uh, epsilon of x, where x is a continuous function. All right, uh, so maybe such a theorem is a bit surprising if you did not see it before, but uh, if you have a slight generalization of the two theorems above, it's very easy to prove. So I thought I'll just give a short sketch for later, for later. So, um, well, you need a combination theorem, a Maglian type theorem, but you can just imagine if you have a ball, no, maybe say a disk of radius r in the complex plane, and you consider the real line r, and then I'm going to start with a continuous function f, uh, it's holomorphic on this disk, and uh, continuous on the real line. Okay. So if you assume that you have a combination of those two theorems uh, above, so just assume, let's see, that there exists a sequence, say, of polynomials, 
approximating converging to f on oh on uh, this closed disk union and let's say the closed disk of radius r plus 2 uh, disk intersected r so i assume that i can approximate this given function on that disk uh, union such an interval then you can just if you take a cutoff function which is zero on a neighborhood of the disk of radius r plus one then it dies when you come out of the disk of radius r plus two if you choose such a cutoff function chi then you just write uh, hj is gj plus cutoff function um, what do you want f minus gj and this function is going to converge um, going to converge to f uniformly on the real line and it approximates the original f on this uh, disk and it's holomorphic on a disk of radius r plus 1. So now you can imagine you just put this into an inductive procedure and you get this uh, approximation result here. Okay, so this was just to emphasize that when we deal with this kind of thing, uh, there are two things. So one thing is you have to prove um, a local theorem, compact result, and then you need some inductive procedure to uh, go to a limit. Okay. Anyhow, so just keep that in mind for later. Uh, this was Kalman. Uh, more generally, it's proved uh, by these guys that, uh, so this is a complete characterization that the closed subset X in a complex plane satisfies Kalman approximation if and only if it has no interior and the complement is connected and locally connected at infinity. All right, so that's, uh, that's one complex variable. Uh, a little bit closer to our case, uh, Rn inside Cn satisfies Kalman approximation and the proof is just not very much harder than this. It's quite simple. Uh, moving away from flat things, it's known that the smooth unbounded curve always admits such approximation. And a bit more generally, these locally rectifiable curves. Uh, however, moving up to higher dimensional submanifolds, things now change in several complex variables because there are polynomially convex, totally real submanifolds uh, which do not admit Kalman approximation. So this, of course, admits approximation on compact sets, it can be exhausted by polynomially convex set, but there is some global business going on that prevents this Kalman thing, uh, Kalman approximation to hold. Uh, and of course what, well, maybe not of course, but if you go back to the, back to this kelditsch uh, labyrinthif uh, characterization, you see that they require, it's necessary that the complement is locally connected at infinity. And somehow this is, uh, well, that's not, correct to say, but, but that's what goes wrong in this case, except that locally connected, that infinity doesn't make sense uh, in this setting, so you have to reformulate, and if you reformulate uh, what that means, uh, you can characterize completely totally real submanifolds of Cn, which admit Kalman approximation. So they have to be polynomially convex, and I'm not going to explain this, have something called bounded exhaustion holes. But this is certainly something that uh, holds for Rn in Cn, and in particular R2n into, uh, in C2n. Uh, all right. Uh, moving 
to holomorphic maps, it's known that uh, a proper, proper smooth embedding from R to C2 can be approximated in the sense of Kalaman by proper holomorphic embeddings of the complex plane itself. And it is known, and this is a little bit uh, closer to what we are going to discuss uh, today, that if you are in CN and you look at So I'm not going to be too precise, so I choose k strictly less than n. And I'm going to assume that I have a, uh, a totally real manifold that's sort of, uh, let's say, just tangentially equal to this. So it doesn't matter what it looks like down here, but it should look like rk near infinity. Then if you choose so this is a bit uh, maybe unfortunate uh, language. If you choose a smooth embedding of this M, which is the identity on M outside a compact set, then uh, you can approximate it uh, in this Kalaman sense by holomorphic automorphisms of uh, uh, CM. All right, and then finally, Finally, uh, the result today, so this is joint work with Fu Sheng Deng. Uh, precisely, it's a positive answer to the question that we started with. You take a simple ectomorphism of R2n, you let epsilon of x be a strictly positive function, continuous, uh, and fix an integer k. Then you can call them approximate by uh, holomorphic simple ectomorphisms. <laughs> Uh, also derivatives up to order. K. All right. So this is very different. So and the requirement that R two n is left invariant, right? So this is a little bit uh, different from this situation here. So here we assume it's necessary to assume that K is less than n. Uh, here, here it's not. It's exactly the same number, right? So here, two n is the k. So the totally real guy here has maximal dimension, and you you want to leave it invariant. This is not what you want to do here. All right. So. So this is. This is. Uh, the main theorem, but this is this is sort of a this is sort of a special case of a more uh, general result. So you can produce many more like totally real submanifolds of, uh, of, of complex symplectic manifolds for which such theorems hold. So I'm going to start by just uh, describing a just uh, a more general setup. Sorry. Yes, 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 yes. I, I don't think you could. This is the order of derivative. Uh, uh, I think if you specify k first, you could say that phi has to be uh, ck plus something you are going to lose some derivatives. <laughs> All right, so in the title, I had uh, co adjoint orbits. So I'm going to say something about that. So I'm going to start uh, with a Lie group. Uh, and I look at the tangent space of the group. Uh, then if you fix an element of the Lie group, you have a conjugation map. So this is just standard things. Uh, this conjugation map fixes the identity, right? Uh, which means that it's differential acts on the, uh, on the tangent space at the identity. Right? And that differential uh, is called the adjoint action of G uh, on the group. All right? Uh, so you want co adjoint action. So now you want an action on the dual space, on the cotangent space. 
And then you just define by duality. So you said that add star, that's the co-adjoint action, at the point G, uh, no, applied to G, acting on a cotangent, is just defined by take the adjoint action of the inverse and let the co, um, cotangent act on that. All right? So then you get an action on the dual space, on the cotangent space. <laughs> and as soon as you fix, so you fix such a, such a psi, and then you take let G act on your, uh, the whole group G act on your cotangent space, you get an orbit. So that's a smooth submanifold of uh, uh, all the cotangent space. Not necessarily closed. But I'm going to assume I'm only going to consider closed ones in this talk. All right. And what does this have to do with uh, then the question? If we look at an example, you look at the Lie group. So let's say a real Lie group consisting of matrices uh, like this. This you identify with R3. The tangent space you identify with R3. And if you just compute what this co-adjoint action is, it's given by this. Okay, so for A and B, this is the co-adjoint action, and you see that C is gone. There is no C. Uh, and then you also see that if you fix X3, then this orbit is just going to be an R2. If you vary B and A in R2, so you just get a flat R2 sitting inside of, uh, sitting inside of uh, R3. So that's the co-adjoint orbit, R2. And if you just complexify this group, you just throw in complex uh, coefficients instead, then you get a co-adjoint orbit, uh, which is just a complexification of that R2. Uh, so R2 just sits inside C2, and that's, um, that's the special case that we considered before, R2 well, in the, when n is 1, that R2 sits inside C2, and we do want to do uh, approximation, okay? But uh, at this point, we did not introduce, there is no symplectic structure here yet. Uh, <coughs> uh, so what do you do? So let's see, uh, how do we get some vector fields? On, uh, I want to define some vector fields on my co-adjoint orbit, and then I want to define a symplectic form afterwards. Uh, so if you take a V in the tangent space, you can consider the exponent map E to the TV. So you can take the adjoint, co-adjoint action of the exponential map. You can apply it to a point in the dual space, right? So then this one parameter family for t is zero, you start on your point psi, and then you just flow inside your uh, co-adjoint orbit. Uh, and so if you differentiate, uh, you get a vector field, right? So I just take ddt, oh, now it jumped, at t equals zero, you get, uh, you get, uh, you get a vector field, and it's complete. You can note for later. It's defined by differentiating a flow, right? So this is a complete, smooth vector field if you look at the uh, real co-adjoint orbit, or holomorphic if you look at the complex one. <laughs> All right. So, and this is also important for later, that now we have lots of complete holo smooth or holomorphic vector fields on our co-adjoint orbits by differentiating these flows. All right. And uh, yeah, this is a complete vector field. Uh, then for two vector fields, you want to define the symplectic form. Uh, you just, uh, at the point psi, then you take the Lie bracket of the two generators for the vector field, so that's a new tangent vector, and then the cotangent can act on, uh, 
this bracket, okay? And then, of course, there is something to prove that this is a symplectic form, but it is a symplectic form. I'm not going to prove that, but that's, that's a standard, uh, standard thing. Uh, and it's the fact that this vector field that we had above is uh, Hamiltonian. Okay? So it satisfies this. If you contract xv with omega, it's closed. Okay? So this is symplectic vector field. All right, but now comes the important thing for us is that you can also, I mean, if you want to define a symplectic or a Hamiltonian vector field, you can do that by using potentials. Yeah? So you take a smooth function, f, on your uh, whatever space, symplectic Manifold, and if you find, the, you can find at least, uh, no, you can find the vector field x, this satisfies df is the contraction of omega with x, then x is a symplectic vector field with potential uh, f, okay? And now comes the important thing here, that this, I think I have it on the uh, next slide that I can say. So this complete vector field has a potential, and the potential is V, okay? So V is something in the tangent space. It can act on the cotangent space, so it's a function. It could be a, or it, you can use it as a potential. And what happens is that you just get that vector field back, okay? So this is the important thing that all that all linear maps on your uh, co-adjoint orbit are potentials for complete vector fields. Okay? So this is the important thing. This is the important thing. So now, uh, yes. So now I'm just going to forget a little bit uh, this. So, so what we are going to do, we are going to look at these real co-adjoint orbits, similar to the Heisenberg group, sitting inside of complex uh, co-adjoint orbits as closed submanifolds. And we have this property here. So I'm just going to forget the orbits and just formulate just a general framework, which is quite simple. So I'm just going to say, okay, let's say we are in Cn, it's Rn plus Irn. I'm just going to assume I have a closed submanifold, and I'm going to intersect it with Rn and get a smooth closed manifold with the corresponding real dimension equal, so maximal real dimension inside Z. I'm going to assume I have a symplectic form on my complex manifold, so that when I restrict to the real guy, I get a real symplectic form. And I'm going to assume that whenever I take a linear map on Cn, and I use it as a potential for a Hamiltonian vector field on um, Z, then that vector field is complete. Okay, so those were the crucial facts for the co-adjoint orbit that we had before. <laughs> and this is certainly the case for R2n sitting inside of, uh, of C2n, okay? All right. All right. So let's see. 
This is going a bit faster than I thought. Um, let's try to look at this approximation uh, of symplectic, uh, symplectomorphisms on the, on the real uh, center here. And then, as I said here, so there are two things you have to do. You need to prove some local approximation statement, something on compacts. And then you need uh, some inductive scheme to build a global object as an inductive uh, uh, limit. Okay? And somehow this induction scheme here gets a little bit complicated, it's a little bit messy, so I'm just going to stick, I'm going to just explain the compact the compact uh, approximation, and then, uh, uh, well, maybe we can indicate uh, indicate uh, later. Okay, so what do we do? So I'm going to consider, uh, ah, so now I have to make some assumption. So if, if, so if I am on R2N and I have a symplectomorphism, Phi, and if it fixes the origin, I can put phi t of x is 1 over t phi of tx. So this is an isotopy, an isotopy of uh, symplectomorphisms, so that when t is uh, 0, you have the identity map. And when t is 1, you have your original phi. Okay, so any symplectic diffeomorphism on R2n is in the C infinity path connected component of the identity. Okay, so this is fact on R2n. And if I work in this, uh, this, uh, abstract setting, I just have to assume that I start with a, a symplectomorphism which is in the path-connected component of the identity. So that just has to be an assumption. So then we take this, uh, this phi t. So then you can interpret phi t as the flow of this time-dependent vector field. You just uh, differentiate with respect to t, right? So now your goal is to approximate, uh, approximate uh, the flow of a time-dependent vector field. So now it lives on your, uh, lives on your uh, real co-adjoint orbit, assume, or real z0. Uh, then it's a standard thing that if you just divide your time interval into many, 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 many small intervals, and you just fix the time at, uh, at the end points of these uh, small intervals, and you consider the flows of the time-independent vector fields, you can approximate the flow of this by just composing, um, by, by composing flows of time-independent vector fields. So that's a standard thing. So now we can forget about the time and ask to approximate the time uh, independent vector field here. <clears throat> All right, so now x is time independent. Hamiltonian, so now I have to make another assumption and that is that, uh, and that, is that uh, my z naught is simply connected because then I can find the potential. So. The smooth vector field X has a potential F. Um, uh, and that potential can be approximated by real holomorphic polynomials, P of Z. So just holomorphic polynomials with real coefficients. Since this Z naught sits inside Rn, it's okay.
So now the point, so now I have, uh, now, now I have a real holomorphic polynomial P of Z. And since it's real, if I use the new, the polynomial as a potential for a new, uh, for a new vector field, it is going to be tangent to the real Z naught, since it's real. So I'm going to, going to get a holomorphic uh, poly, uh, vector field on the big complex manifold, but it's going to be tangent along this real guy, the real center. All right. So now I have a polynomial. Now it's a standard thing that any polynomial in a number of variables can be written, written as a one variable polynomial in linear forms on, uh, well, Rn or Cn, okay? So lambda Jz is just a linear map, linear, uh, linear map from Z, uh, Cn, <coughs> okay? So this you can do. Now you are going to use uh, the assumption. So I assumed that if you, if you forget the power mj and just use the linear guy lambda xj as a potential, then you get something complete. That was, a, that was the assumption, which we had automatically for these co-adjoint orbits. But this means that this lambda j, if you use the, use the lambda j to the mj, is still complete, okay? Because the lambda, if you look at the vector fields you get from the lambda j, this lambda j to the mj is gonna be constant on the level, on the flow curves. So this is still going to be complete. So now if you use p, I mean, you use each, each component here of P uh, as a potential right. individually. What you did was you wrote, wrote X as a sum of complete holomorphic vector fields, and they come from real polynomials, so they are tangent to, to Z naught. Mm -hmm. And then you are done approximating on a compact set because it's the standard thing that if you have a sum of holomorphic, no, smooth or holomorphic for that matter. If you have a sum of vector fields and you want to approximate the flow, then you can flow along the individual vector fields for small amounts of time and compose like this here. So when n goes to infinity, you are approximating phi T and each of the individual, each of the individual uh, uh, components here are symplectic diffeomorphisms because they are time T over N flows of complete vector fields. All right. Uh, so this means, yeah, so I'm not really gonna. So this means, so you start with something Z not, it sits inside some larger complex manifold Z, and you have to choose so a compact we have the diffeomorphism phi, choose compact set K, one, and what we achieved was approximating this phi uh, on this particular compact case. But this phi is going to do something uh, arbitrary outside here, right? So this means that uh, 
let's see, so now it had maybe a psi one or something, so this is not really good, you have to correct it. So you have to do something like considering, okay, now you rather want psi one inverse composed with phi, because if you compose this with this, you're back in business. So now you try to approximate this, and then correct your original approximation, and then you try to set up inductive scheme to exhaust uh, all of uh, Z not, uh, but of course you have to take care that your sequence of maps also converges to a diffeomorphism of C to N. Uh, and that makes it a little bit uh, uh, tricky, but uh, that's basically the idea. And I think uh, actually that I am uh, done, so thank you.